Matter of fact, I dislike these conversions so much, you most likely won't see these on a quiz or an exam. But you might see this. Which of these measurements is the strongest vacuum? Zero PSI gauge, 14.7 PSI absolute, an absolute height rating of 29.92 inches of mercury, a vacuum scale rating of zero inches of mercury, a gauge rating of negative 14.7 PSI gauge, an absolute reading of zero PSI absolute, an absolute height rating of zero inches of mercury, a vacuum scale rating of 29.92 inches of mercury, and just to make it fun, negative 0.1 bars, 10 PSI absolute, two inches of mercury in the absolute height scale, and 28.5 inches of mercury in the vacuum scale. Again, I'm not asking for numerical results or unit conversions. All I'm asking you is to get a general idea of what is and what is not a strong vacuum. If you're up to the challenge, think you could order this list, weakest to strongest vacuum? By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. A couple of these should be super easy. The first four measurements all express the same atmospheric, i.e. no vacuum condition. Zero PSI gauge, 14.7 PSI absolute, 30 inches of mercury in the absolute height scale, and zero inches of mercury in the vacuum scale are all weak, essentially non-existent vacuums. The next four measurements all express the same perfect vacuum condition. Negative 14.7 PSI gauge, zero PSI absolute, 30 inches of mercury in the absolute height scale, and zero inches of mercury in the vacuum scale are all super strong, perfect vacuums. Although unit conversion is always an available option, the next measurements can be ordered with a little thought. Negative 0.1 bars is expressed using the gauge scale. What's a bar? A bar is 14.5 PSI. So 0.1 bar is roughly 1.45 PSI. So negative 0.1 bar is roughly negative 1.5 PSI or something 1.5 PSI lower than atmospheric conditions around 13.2 PSI absolute. It's not a huge differential, so this is a pretty weak vacuum. 10 PSI absolute is about two thirds of the way up to an atmospheric condition, so it's also a pretty weak vacuum, but stronger than no vacuum. Two inches of mercury in the absolute height scale means 28 inches of mercury got sucked out of the 30 inch tube so this is a pretty strong vacuum, although not as strong as a perfect vacuum. Lastly, 28.5 inches of mercury in the vacuum scale means 28.5 inches of mercury got sucked out of the 30 inch tube, leaving roughly only 1.5 inches. Thus, it's an even stronger vacuum than 28 inches, but yet not as strong as a perfect vacuum. I should mention there exist vacuum gauges similar to pressure gauges, only vacuum gauge measures vacuum strength. The schematic symbol is indistinguishable. For obvious reasons, most vacuum gauges shouldn't be hooked up to pressure above atmosphere, nor should regular pressure gauges be hooked up to vacuums. Modern vacuum gauges sure beat using an upended tube of poisonous liquid metal. All right, enough of this. Let's put aside the foolishness of vacuum measurements for a bit and quickly discuss how vacuums are generated and employed in pneumatic systems before we call it a day. One of the easiest ways of creating vacuum is using Boyle's Law, which if you remember correctly is expressed as P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. A lot of the times, Boyle's Law in pneumatic systems is applied to the act of compression, i.e. reduction in volume. If you reduce volume, pressure increases. Boyle's Law also works in reverse. If you increase volume, pressure decreases. Consider an open-end cylinder with a piston at the top at atmospheric conditions. If the piston is pulled forcefully downward, volume in the cylinder increases and pressure in the cylinder decreases. When we start at atmospheric conditions, any increase in volume and consequent reduction in pressure makes the expanding cylinder a vacuum or less than atmospheric conditions. Environmental air outside the cylinder at atmospheric pressure is pulled into the less than atmospheric cylinder, what I've described as a suction action of a reciprocating compressor. In fact, the suction end, i.e. the inlet of a compressor, is essentially the working basis of something called a vacuum pump where an arrangement of inlet and outlet valves allows a reciprocating or rotating vacuum pump to continually perform the suction action. We can observe the suction effect using two double acting cylinders. The cap end of cylinder A is open at environmental air. Similarly, the rod end of cylinder B is open at environmental air. The rod end of A is hooked to the cap end of B. As I pull the rod of cylinder B out, I increase volume in cylinder B's cap end thus reducing its pressure below atmosphere. Atmospheric pressure 
acting on the cap end of A pushes A such that A similarly extends. You may wish to rewind that last part and listen closely. What extends A is not the less than atmospheric conditions on the rod end, but rather the higher atmospheric pressure on the cap end. All the vacuum does is pull out support from the rod end, and the atmosphere is what actually does the work. Another way to generate a vacuum is with a component called, appropriately enough, a vacuum generator. A vacuum generator is schematically represented as a cone or a restriction with a pressurized input and an exhaust. As air speeds up to cram through the narrow restriction of the vacuum generator, it sucks in environmental air through the V-port, creating a negative pressure. Here I've set up a vacuum generator with a vacuum gauge in the V-port and a pressure gauge on the P-input. I like this particular vacuum gauge because it doesn't measure vacuum using the somewhat dodgy vacuum scale in units of inches of mercury, but rather much simpler negative bar readings. With two bar at the pressurized input, looks like we're generating negative 0.25 bar vacuum. If I increase pressure at the input to 4 bar, looks like we're generating just shy of negative 3.8 bar of vacuum. Long story short, increased input pressure and flow rate results in stronger vacuum with understandable limitations. Vacuum generators often use the pretty handy actuator called a vacuum cup or suction gripper. Vacuum cups might be used as the end effector for a robot or some other load handling device. Here's an example of a load handling device featuring suction grippers to manipulate large heavy sheets of glass. Sure beats struggling with this load yourself. Here's a simple circuit featuring a vacuum generator and suction gripper. Vacuum on it sticks, vacuum off it drops. To reiterate an earlier fine point, it's not necessarily the suction directly holding the object in place, but rather because there's less than atmospheric pressure on one side of the object, the atmosphere itself is pushing the object to the suction gripper. For load handling purposes, without complicating it too much, the stronger the vacuum produced by the vacuum generator and the larger the surface area of the suction gripper, the larger the load it can lift. All right, that's all I got for you today. In conclusion, this lecture introduced the somewhat confusing vacuum scale and explored ways to generate and use vacuums in pneumatic systems. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest. We'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your Lazy Lab partner about this resource. Be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates. Thank <laughs> you.